It might not be March, but the madness is here. We saw the highly anticipated rematch between the top two teams as the Hawkins go down to the wire. And we've also got you covered on all the action you need when it comes to the OHSAA playoffs. Plus, Beyond the Court takes us back in time to relive the legacy of a very important Viking. Episode 6 of Hardwood Heroes starts right now. tournament and now it's the time for teams to step up or step aside. With all the action that went down this week, we've got a lot to cover, so let's just jump right into it. But before we talk about the tournament, we start with the Tomcats, who still had two crucial conference title games. Trimble reporter Cameron Up joins us now. That's right, Jack. The Tomcats took on South Gallia, hoping to take home their third straight TBC Hawking title. Trimble took a 12-8 lead in the first quarter, but turnovers were once again a problem in the second. Their lead vanished after turning it over on five consecutive possessions to end the first half. The Rebels went on a 7-0 run and Trimble found themselves down 28-24 at halftime. But the Tomcats would not be denied. Jay Lee Osborne hit a buzzer beater at the end of the third to give Trimble a 44-41 lead. And they never looked back. Leading the way on offense was Jane Six. She was a monster in the post, finishing with 17 points, allowing the Tomcats to hang on to win 56-49 and clinch a share of the TBC Hawking title. Here's what Coach Joe Richards had to say about the historic victory. We had back-to-back, -back and I had to go 5 6 but we've never done it three years in a row. That's a tip to them. That'll always be up there. Three, uh, three Pete in this conference with the, with the caliber of players and teams that are in this conference, that's saying something to those girls, and that's a hell of an accomplishment, and they'll be able to savor that for the rest of their lives. That's pretty damn cool. Now, the Lady Tomcats weren't done for the week just yet. Yeah, with the regular season over, they shifted their focus to the district semifinal game on Saturday against Sims Valley. The Lady Tomcats dominated the Vikings from start to finish. They were able to push the tempo and establish an early lead, taking a 44-22 advantage in the halftime. Trimble once again got equally solid contributions from their well-rounded senior starters. Brianna Osborne finished with 18 points, Emily Young dropped 16, and Jane Six recorded 14. The big lead allowed Coach Joe Richards to give his starting five a rest and allow role players to gain valuable experience on their way to a decisive 72-37 victory. And now let's take a look at the Tomcats' trip towards the state title. Jack, following dominant wins over Southern and Sims Valley, Trimble finds themselves in the district finals again in a rematch against South Webster, the team that handed them their first loss of the season. And much like the girls, the boys also had a TVC title game and a tournament game in the same week. That's right, Jack. The boys began the week with hopes of winning the title outright. And to take us through this crucial rematch, we welcome Peyton Brooker to the show. Jack, last show, we called the first matchup Game of the Year, and this one reflected the same energy. The atmosphere of the gym was intense in Gloucester, as the Lancers had one more shot to share the TVC Hawking title. That's right, Peyton, the Tomcats fed off that energy from their home fans. They were able to run out in transition and jump out to a 9-0 lead to start the game. The Lancers answered back with a 6-0 run of their own, keeping the game close, an entire game leading to the halftime, 34 to 28. In the second half, coming off the senior, Andre Quaco went in on a tear against the Tomcats, hitting critical threes at the right moments. Trimble was able to hold on to that lead until the fourth quarter. The Fed Hawk tied the game courtesy of a technical foul with less than a minute left. On the ensuing possession, Blake Guffey was able to grab the board, put it back up and in to give the Tomcats a two-point lead. The Lancers took a timeout with four seconds to go. From there, Andre Quackwell took care of the rest. Andre Crockwell ended the night with 26 points and said that this shot was a blessing from God. I looked up to him and said, please give me the strength to make this shot and it went in. So that, that's, that's all I was thinking was hoping to God, praying to God that I was going to make that shot. I mean, we just going to keep doing what we're doing. I mean, last game we played them, we stayed in the game, close game. This game we won, so obviously we're doing something right. After the heartbreaking loss, the Tomcats picked themselves up off the mat and began preparations for their sectional final matchup against the Eastern Pike Eagles. As you can see, the Tomcats bounced back from the tough loss to win the sectional title by a score of 83-71. to Blake Guffey took his frustrations out on the Eagles by making himself the game's leading scorer. He dropped 37 points, shooting 13 of 19 from the field, pulled 17 rebounds, and dished out nine to six assists. Bryce Downs had a big game of his own right, scoring 17 points. 
As for the Federal Hawking Lancers, their first playoff game against the White Oak Wildcats was closer than you might think. The underdog Wildcats kept the game close for being a 12 versus 5 matchup. After the third quarter, adjustments for the Lancers came to fruition. The Lancers came back into this game with better shots coming down and less turnover, giving them the 68-61 victory. Sophomore Andrew Earhart had a total of 24 points, having four from downtown. Earhart and the Lancers will go on to play Western on Saturday in the district semifinals. And now these two teams still have a chance to meet in the postseason. That's right, Jack. After Trimble's victory over Eastern Pike and Federal Hawking's win over White Oak, these two teams are one win away from meeting each other in a grudge match for the district championship. We will have to keep an eye on how these boys fare for the rest of the tournament. Now, Peyton, what's been going on with the girls? Jack, after a tough season and the girls look ahead to the future, Grayson Wolf has the latest. The Federal Hawking Lady Lancers finished the season second to last in the TVC Hawking. Despite not having the season that they wanted in terms of wins, head coach Amos Cottrell is taking many positives away from the season. We were 3-16 and overall. We lost six of those games by less than six points. Uh, we lost two by about 9, 10, 11, somewhere in there. So realistically, if we pull a few of those off, you know, we could, could have been close to a 500 ball club. And that's where we felt we should have been. One of the reasons that the Lancers struggled to string together wins was COVID cancellations and quarantining within the team. Um, I know for a while, like, I got COVID. Um, our other starter, Alexis, also had a quarantine because of it. So at one point there was two of our starters out. And I think at one point there was even three of our starters out, so that really hurt us. So. Looking into the future, though, freshmen Larissa McDaniel and Cottrell see lots of good. I'm excited for the talent coming up because I think we'll have way better chemistry and like we'll get to know each other more because like we have a new coach this year so like everyone was like didn't know each other and then but like I feel like the chemistry and the talent coming up I think it'll be really good. We started with a, a whole new coaching staff from 7th through 12th. Um, we're all running the same plays, same offenses, same defenses so you know having those uh, freshmen coming in already knowing our offenses will will allow us to start much more quickly this year we'll be able to hit team camps a lot a lot better uh, it'll be um, more of a continuity and, instead of a rebuilding year reporting for hardwood heroes i'm grayson wolf it'll be interesting to see how the lancers attack next season under the team's young leadership and continuing to talk about division four postseason we welcome eastern reporter ethan Sargent. Yeah, Jack, while Eastern may not dominate the division yet, this season was all about finding young pieces to build around. After getting their second win of the season against Southern, the Eagles carried a little bit of momentum as they took on Paint Valley in the sectional semifinal. As they have all year, Eastern hung tough despite all the odds going against them. They came out firing early in this one as Connor Nolan and Trey Hill drained early threes to guide Eastern to an early 12-7 lead. But Paint Valley would battle back as Dax Estep would take over for the Bearcats. The junior center put up 25 points and 7 rebounds as Paint Valley would eventually pull away and end the Eagles season by a score of 76-60. to Now the game was even at the end of the first quarter. How did the Eagles fall apart? Jack, on the court, Eastern struggled with what it has all year, rebounding. They were out-rebounded 25-20 by Paint Valley, a common theme for the Eagles as their team is quite undersized and they were physically outmatched. The 6'5 S-Step and 6'1 Cordell Grubb had their way down low for the Bearcats, leading to lots of offensive rebounds and easy putbacks. Now on a bit of an odder footnote, this game had some scary parallels. The teams tied the first and third quarter and Paint Valley won the second and fourth quarter by eight points each. And both halves finished 38-30 to the Bearcats. Freaky stuff. A tough end of the season for the Eagles. Which guys are they losing next year? Two seniors in Bryce Newland and Isaiah Reed. Newland was dubbed the Mosquito by the fans at the Nest, and his tough defense and playmaking ability will be missed. Reed is also a tough playmaker inside who makes clutch shots down the stretch, including a huge bucket in Eastern's first win in two years against Southern last month. Coach David Kite talked about the leadership his seniors gave to the young squad. But Bryce exemplifies that. You, watching Bryce play, you don't know if we're up 20, down 20, if it's tied, you, you, you really don't know. And the younger kids need to take that from our seniors about play and compete every single day and to get better every single day. While both Eastern teams may have had early playoff exits, both the boys and the girls have solid young cores that bring hope for the future. Appreciate your work, Ethan. Now moving from Division 4 up to Division 3, we saw two TVC teams with very difficult playoff matchups. Now we start with the Buckeyes from Nelsonville, York. Reporter Cade Williamson joins us now. Yeah, Jack. The NY boys are a team that's been better when playing outside of the TVC Ohio. 
The Buckeyes have had most of their success out of conference this year, which bodes well for the tournament. These victories came against Southern, Eastern, Miller, Crooksville, and Belfry, while also dropping a tough game to burn Union early on. Now, it seems like the Buckeyes have been solid out of conference. How did that translate in their first tournament game? Well, Jack, Nelsonville York traveled to Portsmouth to take on the 11 seeded Trojans. The Buckeyes struggled out the gate as Portsmouth started off hot, hotter than a Florida summer even. The Trojans were high flying all night and slamming it down inside the paint. Portsmouth must have also taken inspiration from Ray Allen himself, draining threes left, right, and center. Nelsonville York didn't help their cause, turning the ball over an outrageous 23 times on the evening. Some bad defense or correction offense from the Buckeyes, but Drew Carter ended his high school career with his staple, Logo 3. Looks like the Buckeyes had a tough night with turnovers. Yeah, Jack, teams have to, ha have to handle the rock if they want to have success. And now speaking of success, how did the girls fare in the next round after last week's victory over Northwest? It was an interesting night to say the least, Jack, as Nelsonville York hit the road to Proctorville in a rematch against the number three seeded Fairland Lady Dragons. The game started off in a stalemate with both teams struggling to get points on the board as the Lady Buckeyes went into the half down 11 to nine. Now it seems like it was a bit of a struggle in the first half for NY. You're absolutely right, Jack. The Lady Buckeyes found limited success offensively all night while Fairland came out to break on a mission, splashing threes. This helped the Lady Dragons pull out the victory 50 to 30. Cade, it's been clear all season that if this offense wants to put up points, it has to run through McKenzie Hurd. That's right, Jack. Hurd was faced with substantial adversity throughout the last four weeks of the season. We caught up with McKenzie Hurd after the loss where she confirmed to Hardwood Heroes that she has played the last month of the season on a torn ACL. She's continued to be the main contributor for NY despite getting more rest leading the way in rebounds and points for the Lady Buckeyes. You can tell that something is off with Hurd, but you would never guess it was something this major. This, this injury to NY star player impacted the team down the stretch and unfortunately their season will come to an end. Yeah, Kate, it has truly been a good run for the Buckeyes. Thanks for the report. Now one other TVC team is still alive in Division 3, the Alexander Spartans. Tim Hanna joins the show now to tell us more about the Spartan search for state. Jack, both the boys and the girls team played for a sectional title this week. The girls were on the road and the boys were at home. The alley was rocking Friday night as the Spartans hosted the 23-seeded Lynchburg Clay Mustangs. Despite being a lower seed, the Mustangs came ready to play. The Spartans came out playing an aggressive zone defense, but the Mustangs were able to break it down and get to the basket early. Despite allowing easy buckets, the Spartans were able to climb back and take the lead early in the second half. The Spartans offense looked like a completely different team in the second half as they were able to distribute the ball effectively and get everyone involved. The Spartans would hold off a late surge from Lynchburg Clay and cut down the nets, defeating the Mustangs 63-58. And shout out to Kyler D'Agostino who put up an impressive 31 points, 10 boards, 5 assists and 5 steals. Yeah Jack, he really stepped up. Um, the, the girls' side of things, uh, the result wasn't quite the same. Uh, their season came to an end at the hands of New Lexington Wednesday night. Early in the game, both teams struggled shooting the ball, and the Spartans went into the locker room down six. Marley Grinstead and Kara Meeks combined for 18 of the team's 19 first-half points. As the second half began, it was a different story for the Spartans. They took the 28-27 lead early in the third thanks to this massive three from Olivia Ohms. As the game progressed, however, they would be plagued by an intense half-court press from the Panthers, and this made it difficult for the offense to generate open looks. Despite keeping it close for much of the fourth quarter, their season comes to a devastating end, 58-48. After the game, Coach Jeff Grinstead talked about how much this senior class meant to his program. You know, obviously, <laughs> hard, this is really hard for me because I've coached those girls since fourth grade. I mean, you know, they were good, all great friends with each other, and, and uh, and that's why it got a little emotional at the end of the game, but and that's also part of it. You know, it's hard to see that you have to end like that. And what a career it has been for Marley Grinstead and Kara Meeks. The four-year varsity starters made an impact on this program from day one. Grinstead made it over the 1,000 career point mark as a junior during the last season sectional title game, while Kara Meeks came up just short. What's most impressive is that this duo only missed a combination of 13 games over four years as starters for the Spartans. Congratulations to both girls on impressive careers at Alexander. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the team can adapt without them. Thanks for the great work, Tim. We said that NY and Alexander had the chance to meet each other in the district semifinals. However, after both teams fell in their individual matchups, there are no more TVC girls teams that remain in Division 3 Southeast 2 bracket. 
Now to break down the boys bracket in the same region, Alexander narrowly escapes Lynchburg Clay and moves on to take the second seed Fairland, a team they met in the playoffs three years ago where the Spartans came away with a 49-26 victory. There were two TVC boys teams left in Division Three coming out of Southeast District 1. The Wellston Golden Rockets fell to Minford 77-48, but a struggling Megs team showed promise against a solid Zane Trey squad. What went wrong for the Marauders? Let's find out. Now here to talk about the Marauders' playoff run is Megs reporter Max Mingay. Thanks, Jack. The Marauders limped into the playoffs, losing four of their last five games, but they look to change this quickly with hopes of a state tournament run. The playoff started for Megs with a homestand against Southeastern. This game started off hot for the Marauders with Braden Stanley hitting three three-pointers in the first quarter. Megs rode this momentum to a 61-46 victory over the Panthers. The win led Megs on a road trip to Chillicothe to take on Zane Trace. The Marauders came into the game as an underdog against the Pioneers and managed to hang with them through three quarters. But the problem with Megs all year has been the fourth quarter and Zane Trace started the final frame with an 8-0 run. By the end of the game, the height of the Pioneers was too much for the Marauders, who were simply outmatched down low, allowing eight offensive rebounds and losing 57-40. After the tough loss, I spoke with Meg's head coach, Jeremy Hill, about the game, and he said, quote, I'm very proud of all my guys from top to bottom, but we have a lot of trouble with turning over and scoring the ball, and I think that was the difference in the game. It was a tough end to the season from the Marauders ball club, who finished the season 12-10. Yeah, Max, but the girls team also hosted a playoff game at home. How did that go? Well, Jack, the crowd was electric as the Marauders opened the game with four three-pointers in the first four minutes. In classic Lady Marauders fashion, the team forced 16 turnovers, leading to chaos on the floor. The chaos led to Megs outrunning Circleville out of the gym in the open court as their fast break play opened up easy looks for some of the more unsung hero on this Marauders team. The team hit 11 of their 12 three-point attempts throughout the contest. This three-point barrage was led by Andrea Marr, who had a stellar game, shooting six of seven from the field and four of four from three. Marr's 19 points led the pack for the Marauders, who had four players scoring double digits. Maggie Musser also had a great game, scoring 17 and giving Megs an opportunity to move on. This game was a shiny example of what can happen when Megs scores their scoring responsibility. So Max, after an impressive first playoff game, how did Megs continue this run? Well, Jack, Megs headed into their first round matchup flying high from their lights out shooting display. But just like Icarus, the Marauders flew too close to the sun and were burned hard, losing the contest by double digits. Sheridan opened up the game on a 10 to nothing run and never looked back, outscoring Megs in every quarter. To add insult to injury, the General shot a blistering 15 of 30 from the three-point line, headlined by Jamison Stinson, who opened the second half with back to back to back three-pointers. Her 18 points led the game in Sheridan to a 82-35 victory. With this loss, Megs also loses three seniors, including Mallory Hawley, the all-time leading scorer in Marauders history, will be leaving quite the legacy in Pomeroy. Thanks for the great work, Max. Had the Megs Marauders won, they would have had to take on the legendary Vinton County Vikings. What makes this team so legendary? Their historical success can be attributed to one man, Rod Bentley. Since taking over as head coach of the Vikings in 2014, Rod Bentley has transformed the program from average to a powerhouse. Just look at the banners, like he did so much for this program and he completely turned it around, completely changed the culture of Benton County basketball. In his seven seasons as head coach, Bentley has impacted dozens of girls both on and off the court. He wanted to make sure we knew the game, he wanted to make sure we knew the fundamentals, we knew the reason behind every play. and. Really, he just grew my basketball IQ so much. So now I can really break down each portion of the game and I really give him a lot of credit for my love of the game. During his time at Vinton County, Rod Bentley won both TVC Coach of the Year and District 13 Coach of the Year four times. But it's far from just the awards and critical games that Bentley helped win. It was the stories he helped create for the Lady Vikings that had been on his teams. We would do these morning workouts and we would have to go out back behind the school and there we have like a big long road that goes up behind a baseball field and there's a water tower at the top <laughs> and he would get these like were they five gallon buckets something know. like they that were they were huge rocks. like big they buckets filled with rocks and water filled with <laughs> rocks and water rain water yeah. and we would have to carry one on each side and like sprint up these hills and if we spilled it you had to pick up as many rocks yes. as you could it was absolutely terrible yeah in his final season as head coach, Rod Bentley won Division II Coach of the Year and led the Lady Vikings to a state final berth. In the final moments of play, Coach Bentley did something that's remembered by all on the team. So we all go like 
we go over to the huddle and we're all looking at the board, like waiting for him to say something. Like, what is he gonna say to us? Like, I don't know. Like, I was like freaking out. So we look at the board and all he writes is mindset. <laughs> And I was like, okay, so then we go out there, get the stop, and it was just the best feeling of my life. I Although no longer on the sidelines of the court, Coach Bentley's legacy will be remembered for years to come. I think that's one thing he will be most known for. He was all in. Yeah. All s eat, sleep, breathe basketball. Yeah, that's about <laughs> that's it. That's all he does, he, I swear. He didn't even sleep for basketball season, <laughs> I, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> for Beyond the Court, I'm Cole Patterson. While the Vikings are already experiencing great success under Brett Jones in his first season, Bentley's success as head coach will forever be remembered by the Viking faithful. But now focusing the Vikings on the present, we welcome in Vinton County reporter Tyler Stevens. Thanks, Jack. Even without legendary coach Rod Bentley, the Lady Vikings are looking to make it four straight district title appearances. After seven years with the program, first-year head coach Brett Jones is upholding a game plan that Coach Bentley mastered. BC is currently on an eight-game winning streak, with their last coming against first-round opponent McLean. This year, better competition comes earlier as Vinton County enters as only as a four-seed. Vinton County won against fifth-seeded Jackson in their season debut, and they, if they could do it again at a neutral site, the Vikings would be a team to watch out for. The Vikings started slow on offense, but the second quarter is where BC exploded, with a stellar performance coming from Tegan Bartow. Heading into the halftime break, Bartow had 15 of the 28 points, allowing only 14 points in the first half. This lockdown defense propelled Vinton County to a win over Jackson. Jackson struggled due to a defensive strategy Coach Jones calls pinching, which the defenders pressure the ball handler and force them into poor decision making. Now, how does Vinton County maintain this level of success? They are still utilizing the system Coach Bentley put in place. Coach Jones is not looking to change much within the Vinton County program, which will keep uh, BC competitive for a long time. This long-standing defense, defensive scheme is why the Lady Vikings took this one 58 to 45. And with this win, the Vikings sweep both matchups against the Iron Ladies as they move on to the district finals. Yeah, Jack, and Megs had the chance to meet Vinton County, but fell in a difficult matchup against the number one seeded Sheridan Generals. Now, the girls weren't the only group of Vikings who had a busy week. How did the boys do? Yeah, Jack, for the boys, it was completely reversed. The Red Raiders showed out on Friday night, and it seemed to translate onto the court. Sheridan's Kalen Pulliam was an absolute animal as he went for 24 points and 7 rebounds. He did whatever he wanted to VC's defense, whether it would be from long range where he shot 4 of 6 or finishing down low with 6 buckets coming in the paint. Senior, senior guard Zane Carr was a bright spot for VC, tallying 12 points, but the offense struggled mightily in the 65-37 to loss. Wow, Tyler, Sheridan really took it to Vinton County that night. Yeah, Jack, Vinton County played fine, but I think giving Sheridan a six seed underranks the Generals, who I believe to be the second best team in the region. After looking at the results for teams in Southeast region of Division II, I developed these power rankings that show Sheridan, why Sheridan would be higher than a six seed. The NBO competition Sheridan faces is tougher than the teams seated above them, even with a spotty conference record of 11 and 5, I believe the Generals will put up a better conference record than McLean's 8 and 2 if they were to compete in the FAC. Sheridan also beat Fairfield Union head-to-head -head 48 to 28, and Fairfield Union swept Logan Elm in their two-game regular season series. Had my power rankings reflected the seedings, Vinton County should have had a more competitive first-round matchup. Thanks for the great insight, Tyler. And finally, staying in Division 2, we visit the rough and rowdy doghouse of Athens High School. To take us through the final week of basketball on the Plains, we welcome in Morgan Anderson. Jack, this week on the hardwood had Athens fans pulling out their tissue boxes. The Bulldogs traveled to Fairfield Union where the Falcons put the brakes on the Bulldogs offense. We see Athens turn over the ball time and time again, having 14 total in the first half. Next, we see why the Lady Falcons are considered one of the best teams in the state, making jump shots just like that. As Bailey Davis tries to get the ball to Kiana Benton, look at that steal by Ellie Lewis, ruthlessly giving another turnover and putting them in the kennel, scoring another three beyond the arc to advance their lead. As Cassie Fetterspiel gets the ball past half court, she's able to sneak in a quick assist to Haley Mills, who gets the easy layup. Asa Holcomb tries to get another bucket for the Dogs, and Mills is able to get herself another offensive rebound for the putback. Despite the Bulldogs' attempt to break the Falcon lead, it was not enough to change their fate after halftime, falling to a loss of 45-37. to Notably, Mills and Holcomb each totaled 12 points in the matchup. Head coach Phil Koska gives us his thoughts on the girls' finished season. Um, we've had our ups and downs. We've fought against really good teams and battled, and it's been a fun season. I've had a good time. 
Um, I've seen a lot of improvement from last season to this season, and that makes us feel good as coach as the coaching staff. So I enjoy it. An absolute roller coaster of a season from the girls' side, but it sounds like the boys still had some fight in them. Jack, the boys exceeded expectations in their sectional semifinal game against Circleville. Circleville's Craig Fleck spread the court early on, letting the dogs know they needed to keep up. Fleck led the Tigers with 15 points. Athens' Derek Welsh and Levi Neal both met the net with 13 points each, and Welsh totaled for nine rebounds. At the half, Athens maintained a lead of 20 to 13. Sounds like a close first half. What helped the Bulldogs to come away with this one? Two words, foul shots. Nathan Shattuck made a home for himself at the charity stripe, scoring half of his points there. Shattuck racked up four of his free throws in the fourth quarter, creating an electric atmosphere on the court and a final dub of 49 to 41. And with that win, the Bulldogs went on to play the one seed Waverly. What happened there? After winning their play-in game against Circleville's, tears were shed as they fell to Waverly 48 to 77. The game started off hot with instant threes by both teams. But the Tigers capitalized on consistent asset Athens turnovers, finding the open man down court and cherry picking buckets. Trey Robertson and Will Futhi were draining threes like it was nobody's business. Welsh led the dogs with 17 points but could not close the Tigers' large scoring margin, leading to a final loss. Jack, with heavy hearts, the boys' season was brought to a close on Friday night. And while it may not have been the season the Bulldogs hoped for, there are definitely positives they can take away. Thanks, Morgan. Now that we've broken down the status of every team's tournament run, it's time to announce our picks for Heroes of the Week. We start with the boys. We talked about the likely game of the year earlier in the show, and this performer was nothing short of heroic. Andre Crockwell took the first meeting against the Tomcats personally and carried that with him into the second game. He finished the rematch with 26 points, shooting 10 for 16 from the field with four of those makes coming from beyond the arc, including the buzzer beater from the parking lot. But Crockwell didn't just rely on a hot shooting performance to get him Hero of the Week. Along with a 63% shooting performance, Crockwell made his presence in every area known. Crockwell finished with three assists, two rebounds, and one steal. Coming off the bench in a game with the TVC Championship on the line, Crockwell is a six-man-of-the-year type player. And while the boys' hero came against Trimble, the Tomcats saw a girl arise in heroic fashion in the midst of a dominant tournament performance. Emily Young was a stat stuffer in her postseason performance against Sims Valley. She finished with 16 points and was superb in moving the ball around. Young has been a great contributing leader on a very talented Tomcat squad that can see another hero in the next couple weeks. Young was not only an offensive mastermind, but contributed on the both sides of the ball. Along with almost securing a double-double on the offensive side, Young pulled in four rebounds and racked up the steals that you would think she was taking candy from a baby. Young is going to need to continue her leadership performance if the Tomcats want to secure a state title. Now we have seen some stellar performances this early on in the playoffs, but like the late great Kobe Bryant said, job's not finished. These heroes will need to elevate their game to another level if they want to lead their teams to a state title. Survive and advance, that is all that matters. We will have to, all the updates on who moves on and who's left behind. For, so follow along on all social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. Let us be your source for all things TVC basketball and your source for the OHSAA playoffs. That is all the time we have for you tonight. But for now, from all of us, we are reminding you to be heroic.